Nyla Magruder is a multi-talented artist based in Western Maryland. She is the author of MFK, a middle grade graphic novel and winner of the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity. Nyla has written comics for Marvel, illustrated children's books for Disney Hyperion, Scholastic, Penguin Publishing, and has also written and provided storyboards for television animation studios. Join us today as we sit down with our very special guest, Nyla Magruder, for part two of our conversation covering her early beginnings and career as a professional artist and author. Hey everyone, we had such a good conversation with Nyla that we didn't want to cut any of it out. To bring everyone up to speed, we start this episode with the tail end of the last, where we're talking about the emotional roller coaster that is life as a professional artist. Thanks for watching. Kind of was just like, you know, it seemed like I had everything and then it was snatched away and I was back to where I was. And then, and then I got hired at Disney and then Marvel reached out and it was like, okay, I'm back on the rise again. And, and that's kind of how the industry is. It's just. It's a roller know, coaster. Waves. Yeah. It's like, a roller coaster. <clears throat> downs. Yeah. And you kind of just have to ride out the waves. Yeah. 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 The second you get off the ride, that's when you're wondering to yourself, like, what if? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you might have that safe accountant job but there will always be that what if part of you that says if i just stuck it out six months longer yeah where would i be on another roller coaster <laughs> on another roller coaster <laughs> right? oh, back in the er with heart palpitations but oh, damn it <laughs> like is there another way to live i don't know and i went to six flags with a friend and it was the worst thing i've ever done we went on this ride. It was like one of their old wooden roller coasters. And up till then, the experience had been pretty tame. And we went on, we got on this roller coaster and there was like nothing, you know, like how some of those like really, like really serious roller coasters, they really strap you in. Like this one straps you in by your legs and that is it. There is nothing to grab onto. So you're just like, the, your top half is just flapping in the wind. Mm -hmm. And we get through this, like, it's going all over the place. It's looping. It's, <sighs> and we get to the end of it. And I look over and I realize, like, that was just the first half. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> this roller coaster, you do all of this, you do this whole track, and then you do the track again. Oh, no. And I'm like, there's more like you have to do it over that is such a great metaphor it's a really great metaphor <laughs> a roller coaster strapped by your feet that doesn't end oh it was the worst <laughs> after that i was like we have to leave six flags now <laughs> never coming back i went off the ride <laughs> I'm an old lady now. I am very aware of mortality. Like you can do this when you're a teenager and it feels like you can live through everything. Oh my God. Like, like every roller coaster now, my life flashes before my eyes. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I feel like the roller coaster always starts too when you're planning your own ride for yourself. It's like that. something else is like, actually, you come over here now. It's like, wait, but I was, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Before there was nothing and then there was everything because you decided something for yourself. <laughs> that was true, yeah. I think, that it, it, I think that happens, going back to what you were talking about with, with MFK and, and, and the, the soapbox uh, time and how there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was everything. And I'm, I'm kind of having, I've been having that moment and and Mia's having that moment, but she can't talk about it. But she's having that moment right now. And I'm so happy for her. But it's like you, it, you know, 
everybody ha- and and but sticking it out yeah. and 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 just doing it and maybe not believing in yourself but there's part of you that is in that autopilot mode where you just go i'm just going to sit here for the next 6 hours 8 hours 10 hours however long and just do me just do this for myself even though i know that nobody cares about it or nobody knows it exists and then the minute you put it out in the world things change yeah like mm-hmm. you i'm not one of those people that can like put work out there um you know cuz i think it'll be popular um cuz that sort of thing bores me. I need to, I need to do work that interests me. And my interests have never really felt terribly commercial, you know, and it kind of starts with, uh, uh, you know, how much anime has influenced me. You know, I came through an art school that was very adamantly against anime style and get me started yeah like and I you know when I first graduated Ringling I went through this period where you know I was trying so hard to give the studios what they wanted and it wasn't working and I was starting to hate drawing and I was like I you know I can't can't start hating drawing now I have like a hundred fifty thousand dollars in loans based on drawing (laughs) And so, and it was, you know, also just driving me nuts. And so I decided like, I'm going to, I'm going to try and get back to the place where drawing made me happy. And I, I, I didn't realize it, but as I started, you know, drawing with that mindset, I realized, oh, it's just anime. Like, I'm happy when I draw anime. <laughs> so I really started leaning into it and MFK kind of came out of this. Um, but, you know, I think, I think to myself even now, like I, I kinda, I kinda want the big bucks cause being poor is, being a poor artist is such a struggle, you know, creating and having financial insecurity at the same time is not great. And, you know, I want security. I want things that will sell. Like, and I, I still kind of have a foot in animation and film. You know, I think it'd be great if I had some books that got options, you know, some pitches that got greenlit, but so much of the storytelling I want to do, I just can't picture it, you know, in that space. I can't picture, um, like, I don't want to write books with the intent that they get optioned for film. You know, I kind of want to write books that are hard to translate in film. And like, I don't want to sacrifice that experimentation in the book realm just to make more money. And it's a constant, you know, it's a constant struggle is you know, just pursuing pursuing what I love about art and seeing where that takes me versus what it feels like the industry is asking of me. How do you keep yourself on the right side of that struggle? I say no to a lot of jobs. Like I turn down a lot of stuff because you know, I've been, I've been in that position where, you know, like one of the things I hate is when a client tells me like right off the bat, hey, don't draw like you usually draw. <laughs> Why would you hire me and tell me that? <laughs> Find literally anybody else. <laughs> you could have hired anybody, not me. <laughs> And so I'm very, you know, I'm very selective now um, with the jobs I take and 
you know, I kind of have to think about like how much work is going to be involved here and what sort of battles am I going to have to fight with this client, like battles that I can't even foresee. And so, you know, back when, back when I was really poor and I really needed to work the work, um, what I would tell myself is, you know, a lot of those jobs I was getting, a lot of those freelance jobs back when I was first starting out were so low paid. And so I would tell myself, unless it's paying serious money, don't take it. You know, you're better off. Um, you're better off spending your time working on your own stuff for free because you are your best client. Mm -hmm. And so I would just turn down every job. So I would have free time to work on my own stuff. And that's kind of where I am now is trying to find that balance of making just enough money to be comfortable, but not overwhelming myself with work so that I have time to explore the things I want to do yeah. and to do them on my own terms. Mm -hmm. Because once you sign a contract, it's on that company's terms. And so I want to always have like a little pocket for myself where I can play and experiment and have fun and be self-indulgent. And if I come up with a product that I think, oh yeah, I'll try to sell this, you know, then great. But, you know, I don't want in that space, I don't want everything I produce to be just to sell. Yeah. You know, some things I just want to like, figure out for me, or I just want to, you know, I just want to get it out, just have that, like that artistic catharsis for myself. But it's a, it's a very hard balance. Yeah. I have a, this, I've messaged you off and on um, when I have questions about certain publishers or uh, that you might've worked with or, or, just checking to see if you have worked with them um, or have any, or had any bad experiences with, because the, the one thing with being an illustrator or working in this industry long enough as a freelancer, especially as a freelancer, is you know who you enjoyed working with and who was an absolute nightmare. Mm. And you know, some, some, some artists are, are more vocal than others about that, you know, that uh, relationship. So um, I always like to just reach out to people and say, have you, have you done any, any, know anything about these people? No, they're cool. I'm like, okay, good, great. So then, then you, then from there, you can decide whether you're going to say yes or no to, to the job. But I'm just curious uh, from an illustration point of view, um, is it, how do you, mentally shift is there a mental shift when you do a children's book versus like a book cover or something like that like this it's a stylistic shift but do you have to do anything mentally to shift gears you know what i mean like when you're doing a children's book versus a cover or something like that well even when it's a stylistic shift it's still kind of a mental shift too because mm -hmm. every project wants different things. And, you know, how I think about picture books and that audience is very different from how I think about middle grade books or how I think about a graphic novel. You know, picture books to me are like poetry. And it's really about communicating in a very confined amount of space. Because, you know, kids today, like the standard for picture books these days, it used to be different. Like picture books back in the day could be very wordy. And now brevity is, you know, the mark of a modern picture book. But they're also very, they're very artistic. And there's like a certain, there's, certain, there's a certain whimsy, I think to a picture book. And then 
you know, when it comes to older audiences, I think you add a bit more drama, um, you know, like my paintings for What Are You are, you know, I kind of think of them like this liminal dream space. And I was, you know, kind of creating this world. I really didn't, I really didn't know what I wanted out of that book artistically, but I knew I wanted it to be beautiful and I wanted it to be kind of uh, melancholy and sad, but beautiful and whimsical. And then when it comes to painting things like the Heroes of Olympus covers or Dactyl Hill Squad, which are both, well, one's middle grade, one's YA. It's all about exciting, you know, like I wanted those to be cinematic, you know, like, with Dactyl Hill Squad, it was very, you know, it's like, you know, kids riding dinosaurs. Like that's, that is fantastical in a very different way. Um, and then with graphic novels, like, I don't know, because you have more space in a graphic novel to tell the story, you know, picture books are one thing and then covers are another thing. They're, you know, like I, I try to explain this to writers and people who are on the writing side of publishing that don't draw, that when you move over into the visual space, space and time become two very different, two very important elements. And they're, they're part of the storytelling in a way that you don't have over when you're just dealing with words. And so, you know, to convey the story in the space of 40 or 50 pages versus in the space of one illustration versus in the space of 200 pages are two very, two, <laughs> three very different journeys. <laughs> And yeah, it takes going into each in a different mindset because everyone has to achieve a very different goal. So what's your time management like? I'm just, cause we've talked about this in the past. <laughs> well, and... it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you have a schedule? Do you have a, an alert on your phone, I, you should be working right now kind of thing? Or is it, are you a night person? Is it, what's, what's your deal? I feel like everybody we ask this question cringes the moment we ask it. God. <laughs> like my art directors and editors are gonna watch this and be very disappointed in me. But they, I, I feel like they probably already, you know, get the idea. Um, Cause I, I rant about schedules a lot. Like it's, it's kind of become my one defining trait online um, because I think in general, illustrators work way too hard. Like the demands on our time are grueling, yeah. like unrealistically so. And it's really hard to have that conversation. <laughs> it's that, you know, we've been having this conversation online for like years mm -hmm. that art is undervalued mm -hmm. and like, in my world, I can definitely see things changing for the better, but I don't know if I see it changing industry-wide. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just to start there, I don't think any of us get enough time to do the work. But as for me and my process, number one, Google Calendar. So all my deadlines are in Google Calendar and I set up alerts like two weeks out. So I always know when I've got a deadline coming up and like at the start of two weeks, I get more frequent reminders like, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this so that I know like, you know, in the first like half of that project, I can, I can fool around a little bit, but eventually it's gonna get serious and I need to tighten up. Um, my, I do a bit of like a triage, I guess, uh, method when it comes to balancing projects, you know, whatever, whatever the most pressing deadline is, is the one 
that takes top priority. And I kind of, you know, move back and forth between projects. Um, as a deadline gets closer, I will shift focus on that entirely until it gets done. And then I will move to the next thing. But while deadlines are still floating in the air, you know, I'll kind of bounce back and forth. And so, you know, I, I always have, I always have more than one project in the air so that if I get exhausted with one, I can just shift over to the next. So I don't, you know, I'm not like drowning in one, like constantly day in and day out, I can move around and still stay productive. And like, it feels, it always feels to me like I'm not doing enough because I feel like I'm never making enough project on any or enough progress on any one project. But like what is happening is that I'm making a little bit of pro a little bit of progress on a bunch of different things. And so I'm just like constantly, I'm just constantly working all the time. Um, but I think I'm someone that, you know, I do get burnt out, but I'm comfortable enough with the work I do that just doing this stuff day in and day out doesn't impact me too much. It could also be that I do try to, like, I'm just hearing, friends disagreeing with me in my head. I, I do try to go easy on myself. And so, because I'm kind of at a point in my career, in my life where I just can't crunch. I can't do all nighters. Like I, I, I literally physically can't do it. Like there was a point where, you know, I got all this ergonomic stuff and it's, it's made it a lot easier to just sit at my computer and work for hours. And I was like, you know, I got my ergonomics set up and I was like, finally, I'm going to really sit down and focus and I'm going to get work done. And I would, you know, I'd work and I'd work and I, I'd hit like day four and all of a sudden my arm would just give out completely. It would just erupt in pain mm. and and I'd just be done for like the next three or four days. Yeah. And so I kind of realized like, so I can no longer, I can no longer do that. Like I know a lot of illustrators get through their projects by working constantly just around the clock. I can't do that anymore because if I try, like I have these, pain points that weren't there 10 years ago, but they're there now. And one is my left arm and the other is my lower back. Mm -hmm. And if I push them too far, they snap. And they're already pretty bad and I don't want them to get worse. So I know like my limitations now, I can work a few hours a day, like at certain tasks and then I have to pull back. And so like with drawing and, you know, the drawing is really hard on the left arm. So I can do that for a few hours in a day and then I have to stop. And so I'll switch over to like writing. And, and this is kind of how, this is kind of how I make this work is I limit the illustration jobs I take. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a graphic novel I'm illustrating, I'm not illustrating any other graphic novels. I might take a picture book, but generally I don't. And that's why I haven't published any more than like two. I might take some covers, but generally I've got that one illustration job. Writing jobs, however, are a lot faster and I can take more of those. And so I might have one illustration job and like two or three writing jobs. And so in a day I can do a bit of drawing and then do a bit of writing and then do a little bit of drawing and then do some writing. 
and I'm not overexerting myself. But, you know, I listen to my body a lot more now. And if I'm just not feeling it, I don't work. And, you know, I'm, I'm older now and sometimes I just don't feel good. And I have depression and some days I just don't feel good. Like I can't think, you know, it's just not there. Like nothing, you know, and it's, it's so hard sometimes as a children's book writer, because some days will be really hard. And then I've got to write like some happy kid story where, you know, everything turns out okay in the end. And like kids learn like uplifting lessons. And some days I'm just not feeling it. And on days like that, I just don't do the work. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, you know, sometimes I will tell my editors, I'm sorry. Like, I know I had this deadline. I don't have anything for you. <laughs> like, can we push that deadline? Like, it is 2022. We are two years into a pandemic. Like, I know you guys have stuff going on. My editors have stuff going on. I'm like, can we all just agree that everyone's got stuff going on and like our production levels right now are ridiculous. <laughs> we are all living through this enormous amount of trauma and, and still like putting books out. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'm very lucky that I'm in a position where I can kind of say, hey, <laughs> hey, can you guys just back off a bit? But I still try to hit my deadlines, you know? Sure. And like, I'm a faster writer than I am illustrator. And one of the, you know, when you're an illustrator, like to meet those deadlines, there, there are the, the time management tools, you know, I, I stay, you know, I, I use Google, Google calendar to keep organized and I, I'll use spreadsheets that kind of calculate like, um, you know, how much time on a graphic novel I have, like how many pages I need to get done in a day or a week. And I use, um, I use toggle this app called toggle and I track my hours. And so that it's, that is really helpful, especially with graphic novels in particular, because I can look at how much time on average it takes me to do like inking a page or like lettering a page, that sort of thing. And so I always, you know, kind of have a mental record of like how much, you know, how much I can get done in a certain block of time. And so what gets me through is a lot of like, a lot of math in my head really. But, you know, the other thing is like with graphic novels, yeah, work quickly. I don't do this when I'm painting. With painting, I like to take my time, but with graphic novels, you know, every, you know, not every panel needs to be a masterpiece. You know, graphic novels are books that you can read quickly. So like an illustrator can do the art quickly as well. Like you can, um, you know, you can streamline, you can simplify, like not every element in a panel needs to be in focus, needs to be detailed. And you can, you know, cut time that way. You can streamline and speed up the process. But it also kind of makes me sad to think about this because when it comes to hitting these tight deadlines and my, my deadlines are kind of okay, but some of the requests I get for new projects are like, you know, the idea of doing 200 pages like full color in a year, I just can't do it. And I think the people who do are working very quickly. 
I think they're cutting corners. I think they're doing all that simplification and working fast to get the work done mm -hmm. because you can't be detailed and meticulous and still get the work done in that time frame. But I think to myself, it's unfair to expect every graphic novel to be done quickly because graphic novels are art. And I think some works of art deserve the Sistine Chapel treatment. They deserve to be detailed and meticulous and pristine. And it's unfair to ask every artist to sacrifice that for the sake of a publishing date. Like I think some books just take longer and that's okay. Like some books should take longer. Yeah. Well, especially when, I mean, when the, when the publisher is just worried about the bottom line, they're just worried about getting it on, on bookshelves by a certain date so that they can make their money. Yeah. They don't really care about your mental health, your physical health, as long as you've turned out what they've asked for. Yeah. So. Like, you know, and yeah, like I'm a person, you know, and I have things going on and <laughs> Yeah. Like I'm not machine. When you, no. <laughs> uh, like right. when you email an editor and you have to say, like, hey, I'm not gonna make this deadline. It's such a shitty feeling yeah. because you've signed a contract, you've made an agreement, and you know, for that editor's impression of you to be that you can't hit a deadline, it just makes you it makes you feel small. But at the same time, you know, and then you, then you can't explain, like, you can't say this is the reason because oh, I always do. I I'm, I'm that, I'm that excuse guy. You know, uh... <laughs> I never, I never give the, I, I never give the excuse. Sometimes I'll just say, Hey, like things are going on, but I never give the excuse. Cause I don't want to bog it down with that. But yeah. you know, like, like in the last two years, I'll tell you right now, like in the last two years, my father died. I have moved three times. One of those was a cross country move. Um, I'm in a land dispute suddenly with my neighbor. I've been here two months and like my neighbor's just been using our backyard as a dirt bike, like course. And they're mad at me because I told them to stop. Like, you know, I just... I, I bought a puppy and had to give it back because it had medical uh, medical issues, like really expensive medical issues. And this is this is all in the last three weeks. And also it was Christmas and New Year's. Oh my God. And I have deadlines. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, like, I'm sorry guys, but I'm really sad about my puppy. And every time I hear a dirt bike motor, I have a small panic attack and I don't know how to explain that <laughs> and say, Hey, can you just give me a few days? Like, cause it's, it's so personal to me. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not that I don't want the work to get done. It's that every day is a struggle to be alive right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some, and this is, such a cerebral job yeah. you know we put so much of our heads and our emotions into this work like it's such a you know this isn't like tallying numbers on a spreadsheet like I'm working on a graphic memoir right now and so I'm like constantly thinking about my childhood and, and it wasn't great. <laughs> and, and I'm mining my personal experiences to put on a page. And it's, you know, that takes a lot out of you. Like, you don't do that. And then five seconds later, be okay. Like, okay, on to the next scene. Like, you just dredged up some very deep feelings. And now you have to process them because now they're here because you just dug them up and you have to, you know, you have to do something with them. And it's, it's rough. Like it's a rough job. 
So what do you do to, what do you do for self-care then? What, what, what's, what does Nyla do at the end of one of those tough days with deadlines looming and all that history being dredged up? What do you do for yourself just to relax? I watch shows, I listen to music, I'll read a book. I'm really into gardening right now. I'll go stare at my plants, see if they'd need anything. <laughs> I'll go outside. I'm feeding the birds because it's been snowing a lot and it's fun, like, it's fun to watch the birds, you know, eating seeds and nuts. I'll go walk my dog. I'll, you know, cuddle my cat. I'll go drive somewhere. You know, sometimes it's nice to just be on the road and be by yourself. Yeah. Like I'll just, you know, I've always been kind of like very nature oriented. So, you know, you know, one of the reasons losing the puppy hit me so hard is that I need something to take care of, you know, like funny enough, like a puppy sounds like a lot of work, but it was actually giving me a lot of structure. Like I was actually getting more done with her because taking care of her required so much discipline that it required the rest of my life to be disciplined. And so like I had these set times where, you know, she goes down for a nap. That's when I work. And my schedule was like every day, my schedule was tight. And like doing this actually gives me more energy. Like it's weird. You know, the more I do, the more I have to do, the more energy I have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was getting up at 6 a.m. with this dog, but I could do it because for some reason, I don't know, it seems counterintuitive, but it like doing all this crap, like gives me more energy. And when I don't have as much, it's so much easier to just stay in bed and not want to get up. Mm. You know, like I adopted a dog last year because I realized like six months into the pandemic that there were just like entire days when I didn't even open the front door. Mm. And I was like, I need to get outside. And so I adopted a dog because a dog, I knew a dog would force me to have to go outside. And it was, you know, the best decision, you know, like a dog is not a substitute. Oh my God. A dog is not a substitute for <laughs> oh, monster. So a dog is not a substitute for like therapy, but you know, my animals are the reason I can get up in the morning because they need me. Yeah. And, you know, it's so, you know, without that, it's so easy to just stay in bed and not get up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm very familiar with that feeling too. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a pretty full day between pets and the neighbor drama and your 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 just your regular workload yeah so yeah it's pretty heavy so it's, it's a lot but I mean you're yeah. you're managing um yeah and you know like I said before that pocket of time to just create things that are self-indulgent for me like it's still work, but, you know, like as a freelancer, it's so hard to relax. You know, you're always, you take your vacation time and just fill it with more tasks. And that's not really relaxing. Wow. Like you're still working, <laughs> but it's more relaxing than being on deadline, mm -hmm. you know, having a free space to create at your pace, at your leisure, and to 
you know, it's something that um, is not going to go up against like the judging committee of whatever, you know, whatever client you're working with, it's just for you. But I'm trying to be better about also setting aside space where I just don't do anything. Um, so what is the biggest piece of advice you would have for artists that are trying to get into this industry? I mean, I would think long and hard about what sort of career you wanna have. And your career doesn't have to be art. Like there are so many different ways to be an artist and being a professional artist is not the only way. Like, you know, you hear so many stories about artists who burn out, like the artist that hates drawing because it's their job. And, you know, if you love your relationship with art as a hobby, preserve that. Mm -hmm. Me personally, um, I wanted art to be my work. Like I reached a point where, I reached a point where I kind of hated doing everything else. You know, I, I hated being bored at work. I hated being yelled at at work. And, being an artist is something I can do. You know, it is, a, it is a challenge that I can do. It's not easy, but it's a set of challenges that I can manage as a professional. And no, I don't draw in my free time anymore. I don't draw to relax. I do, you know, when it comes to relaxation, I will look for anything that's not drawing. And that's totally fine with me. Like, I, I don't need to draw as a hobby anymore. I just found new hobbies. And now those are the things I do to relax. Those are the things that I don't monetize. So, you know, I would think hard about your relationship with art and how you want to maintain it. good answer nice. yeah um i'm i'm learning i mean i i have no interest in doing random sketches or filling a sketchbook yeah. um in between i i don't understand people like that like, go yeah. go do something with yourself like i'm <laughs> <laughs> i don't know but yeah, yeah it's it's a job so i'm not i don't have anything to prove to anybody right yeah so it's not like back in art school, we took our sketchbooks everywhere because we were still learning, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, like you had to put, put in those hours. And then you move out to Los Angeles and there are still some artists that like take their sketchbooks. You go out to lunch and they'll take their sketchbooks with them and draw during lunch. And I'm like, why? <laughs> it feels so <laughs> antisocial too. It's like, well, I'm trying to talk to you right now and you're trying to sketch my portrait. Can you stop? <laughs> <laughs> we're finally Seriously? free yeah. we have 45 minutes before we have to go back to the office why yeah. <laughs> like you're about to go back to this already like you don't have to <laughs> what are we doing and I think it's because art school had taught you that you have to take it everywhere that yeah. like you're not a good student you're not a good artist if you don't always have your sketchbook when in reality you're not a good artist if you're not spending time observing the world around you right if you're buried exactly. in your sketchbook you're not actually seeing everything so like, yeah. what are you doing? Put it away sometimes and just let yourself absorb it. And then later express it. Yeah. yeah. Like something, I, I always want to take pictures, you know, to have reference. And, and first of all, I never use that reference. I take so many <laughs> pictures and I never actually use them. Yes. But second of all, like I'm very conscious of the fact that not very many cameras can fully capture what you see. And so like, sometimes I'll take a picture, but sometimes I will just stare at a moment. Like I, I spend a lot of time staring at the sky and just contemplating colors and clouds. This sounds so poetic, but I spend a lot of time just staring and trying to just imprint 
like imprinted in my brain. Like, and just remember, you know, what it looks like and how it makes me feel instead of trying to capture it in the moment, yeah. you know, to see things with my own eyes and not through the filter of, uh, you know, a camera lens or through the filter of like the drawing that I just sketched, you know, as representation of it, you know, just try to be in the moment and experience that moment and remember that moment. That's perfect. I like living that way as well. Yeah. 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 And I just try you, that and fail practically every day. Oh, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that whole being present thing, that's, uh, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hard. I think one of the tricks to it is kind of like, I think I actually I talked to my brother about this, but looking at things as if it's like the first time you've seen them and really absorbing them and being like, allowing yourself to just be fascinated by what's around you. Yeah. Just like, I love that this moment will never be the same, even if it's the same view, you know, on a different day. And just, I don't know, when I can tap into that moment and feel like I will never repeat this particular sensation, it's actually really powerful and magical yeah. and I want that feeling more often. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's very uh, hard to keep yourself in that mindset. I think it's actually part of mindfulness. Yeah. But it's something that you have to practice. You're not going to be good at it immediately. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But it's supposed to be hard. I, I think somebody made this connection. I never forgot it after I heard it. But it's, it, you know, when you go to the gym, the weights don't become any less heavy, you know, the yeah. more the more you practice, you know, the, the whole point is that it's got resistance, that it is difficult, you know, and same with, with being present or meditating, it's supposed to be hard. It's, it's the practice that that's what you have to do every day, but yeah. So Nyla, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, uh, taking us through that journey, through your journey uh, from, you know, humble beginnings to you know, working in different animation studios and finding your place uh, in this industry and doing the things that you love. Um, it's really been about perseverance and taking risks. I mean, would you be where you are right now doing the things that you actually care about if you hadn't saved up your money and went back to school or Know, did the things that you needed to do to get to 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 live the life that you wanted to live to be happy in your place of employment or you know being happy making the you know being happy in your life you know in your career um so this has been it's been really great to to hear your your story and uh, uh thank you thank you again for for joining us thank you so much um, yeah thanks for having me do you have anything so, that you want to promote before we go? Yes. Uh, I guess I should mention that I have a picture book coming out in a couple weeks or a week. I don't know what day it is. <laughs> I don't know how many days happen, but I have, a, I have a picture book called What Are You? coming out on January 25th. You can pre-order now from your favorite bookseller. Uh, go indie if at all possible bookshop.org if you don't have an indie bookseller in your town um, yeah January 25th oh wonderful I thought that was already out maybe I, I was so too. it was supposed to be out okay, Pandemic. That's okay. <laughs> I was I saw pages from that last year and I thought oh this is really cool how did you see pages? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, no, it's. I'm we'll talk about sure. that later. This is uh -oh. the. This is the. This is all of the. This is like the the animals looking like. Maybe I just saw the cover, yeah. but I'm pretty sure I saw interior art as well. I might have posted interior art, honestly. But no, I mean it's been done. It's been done for a while. Wow. <laughs> it was supposed to come out last year. But yeah, Amazon pushed. might have spreads of that. 
like it could yeah yeah so because i know i've seen it i know yeah. i've seen some but no that's great because i i really want to yeah. i need to go to the store and check that out i'm excited yeah. Yeah. um because you're 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 everywhere so this is it's really cool to to see your work pop up um really happy it's out there i'm really happy that you found your place um because it is it is a challenge this is a challenging profession for sure so yeah but anyway thank you <laughs> thank you so much for joining us yes thank um, you so much nyla yeah. no, so thank you guys. yeah for our listeners pre-order <laughs> nyla's book because it's coming out tomorrow from the day it's aired so <laughs> let's the calendar we'll so, have the link in the show notes too yeah link is in the in, in the comments but um yeah thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it this has been wonderful oh thank you all right bye everybody thank you for watching if you enjoy these episodes and would like to see more please like and subscribe. It will help us grow the channel and keep you informed about upcoming episodes.